Well, this morning, um, we are going to be in the book of Ephesians chapter, chapter 3. I'm going to invite um, Rachel to come up and she'll read for us. You guys, if, if you don't have Bibles, there are Bibles underneath the seats in front of you. It will also be on the screen. Um, we'll be back in Genesis next week, but I wanted um, to just take this week to kind of talk about um, the church and, and why the Lord gave us the church and how the Lord has been faithful in and through his church um, not just over the last five years, but throughout all time. And so you guys can follow along in your Bibles or on the screens. We'll read Ephesians chapter 3, verses 7 to 13. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden in for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him, so I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Amen. Thank you. Would you join me in prayer for our time this morning in the Word? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Word. God, we thank you for your truth. We thank you um, that you, when you saved us, you didn't leave us on our own, but that you gave us the church. Um, and so, Lord, I pray that you would bless this time together as we gather in your name, around your word, worshiping your son, who you gave freely for us. It's in his name that we ask all these things. Amen. Amen. Well, recently, um, one of my friends asked me, he said, Michael, you planted a church when you were young. Do you have any advice for young church planters? I said, yes, don't do it in your 20s. Um, you know, and, and I know some of you guys laugh because you know, like, the start of our church wasn't necessarily the easiest start. Um, year one, we had a massive church conflict. Year two, we had um, a worldwide pandemic. Year three, uh, my wife and I decided to start fostering, and then that had all of its ups and downs. And so um, they don't really teach you any of, like, how to navigate any of those things in seminary. They just teach you kind of how to study the Word and how to um, kind of have a church service, which is great. But um, as I've reflected on the past five years, w one thing that I've said over and over and over is just how thankful I am, as, as Buck mentioned and Dick mentioned and, and Vicky mentioned, just you guys, um, the people that have been here with me, um, especially some of the families that have been here like the long haul of these last five years. I mean, like, I don't think I would still be pastoring or in ministry had it not been for a mature core team around me and my wife to strengthen us um, every step of the way. I mean, I was, I was young, immature, insecure. I still am, but I was way more back then. Um, and I remember as, as we were planting, I had a couple conversations, and these were supposed to be recruiting, like, hey, come be a part of our church plant team. But uh, me being the naive 26-year-old I was, they weren't the best recruiting conversations. I remember two specifically I had, um, one with Sally and Daryl and one with Mark and Kelly, and they were both pretty similar. Um, I was kind of, they said, hey, we want to be a part of the church plan. I'm like, why on earth are you going to do that? And they were like, well, we live in Hewitt. Why wouldn't we? And I'm like, okay, good point. But you have, you have friends. You guys have kids. Um, like Sally was running the kids ministry at that time, which was, you know, she started from her kids and a couple of their friends up to like 100. I mean, it was, it was a massive thing. And I'm like, okay, so you're leaving all these areas that you guys are serving in. You're leaving a lot of friends that you've made over almost a decade. And um, you're leaving like friends for your kids to then come out there, and both of them were like, yeah, we know, God's going to provide. And, and then, and I don't know, again, I'm not trying to like tell them not to come as a church plant, but I'm like, why in the world though? Like I'm 26, my seminary degree is still in my tube, like my wife and I barely have a year of marriage under our belt. I, I, I don't have a, like what in the world are you doing following me? And both of them very lovingly, and I'll never forget this, they were like, Michael, we're not following you. Our trust isn't in you, it's in the Lord. And yeah, you're, you're young, you're going to grow, we're, we're there to grow with you. And I think that, that stuck with me because that's come back to me over and over and over again over these past five years as I've reflected on this. 
mean, we've had our ups and downs, but I, I don't think we would be here today had it not been for the Lord. Right? I think if, if everyone's hope was in me or hope was in a leader or a pastor, like if it was up to me, we wouldn't, none of us would be here. This could be a school, this could be an apartment complex, I have, I have no idea, but the only reason we're here today is by God's grace and by his power. Amen? That is the only reason we're here today. And so as, as I was thinking on, you know, what, what should we preach? It's probably, you know, I don't know if I want to get into Genesis for our five-year anniversary. Um, and so we were kind of thinking through, and those of you who were in our core team, you remember when, when before we planted, we prayed the, the prayer at the end of Ephesians 3 almost every single time we met, specifically the last two verses, right? To him who is able to do far more abundantly than all you can ask or think, to him be the glory, both in his church and in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen. And so I was looking back over that and thinking about the whole prayer starting in verse 14, I kind of was like, well, what if I just rewound that a little bit? Because it's the part that we prayed and focused on a lot was on the glory of God, but the part of the prayer before that, Paul's asking for spiritual strength. And so I go, okay, yeah, where, where have we gotten our strength over the last five years? What, as, as we reflect on these last five years, what has been our strength? What has sustained us? And obviously, Paul, being a very logical person, he puts that in the couple of verses before the prayer. And so what I want to do this morning is just look at those verses that Rachel read, verses 7 to 13, and show you that our strength comes, obviously comes from the Lord, but he gives us three gifts as his church to strengthen us for the work before us. The first one we see in verses 7 to 9, we have a God-given message. Right? We have a God-given message. Paul says, of this gospel. Well, what gospel? What is he talking about? Well, um, if, if you weren't with us last year when we were preaching through the book of Ephesians, basically the first chapter or two is, is about this gospel that reconciles us to God. He begins in the beginning of chapter 1, verse 1 to 14, with this triune cosmic gospel, right? That the, that the Father in eternity past chose to save us for his glory. And then he accomplished that through Jesus Christ, his son, who he sent, who bled and died for us to ransom us back to him. And by his Spirit, we are now sealed. We have the guarantee of our inheritance, which is eternal glory, and we're being held for all eternity. And then Paul just bursts into prayer and bursts into praise and, and gives this amazing prayer of thanksgiving. And then he says, now, let's take it from the cosmic level down to the ground. What does this look like in your life? And, and in chapter 2, verse 1 to 10, he talks about how we, individuals, how we were saved. He says, you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, meaning your nature was sinful, your choices were, like you knew nothing other than sin, and you could do nothing other than sin, and you were by nature and by choice children of wrath heading towards destruction. But, verse 4, but God being rich in mercy, he made a way for us in Christ Jesus. He sent Jesus to, to die for us while we were still sinners, not when we cleaned ourselves up or got ourselves right, while we were in the act of sinning against God, hostile towards him, he sent Jesus, his beloved son, to die for us, to ransom us and bring us back. And it's by faith, it's by God's grace through faith in Christ that we can be reconciled back to God. Friends, if, if you've never heard that, maybe this is your first Sunday here, your first Sunday at church, if you've never heard that, the gospel is for you. The gospel is repent of your sins, believe in Jesus, turn to him. It's, it's free, it's, it's, it's yours in Christ. And, and this is what I love, you can be reconciled back to God by nothing you've done, all by what Christ has done. And for those of us who have been reconciled back to God, well then Paul continues in, in chapter 2, verse 11, and he goes on and he says, we've now been reconciled to one another. We've now been reconciled to one another. If, if, if I'm united to Jesus and you're united to Jesus, then that means, well, we're stuck together, right? We're united to one another. And the gospel does this. The gospel is the very power of God, is what Romans 1 says. It's the power of God unto salvation, meaning it can reconcile hostile sinners back to a holy God, and it can reconcile two people groups that are hostile and different. It can bring them together into one new man. Now, I, I don't want you to miss this, because I, I don't want us to miss part of the gospel here, all right? 
A lot of us go, yeah, Paul, man, he is all about justification. He loves talking about how we are saved by grace through faith. And I'm like, yes and amen. I've read Acts. I've read all of the the letters that Paul's written. He is crazy about that. As excited as Paul gets about our personal salvation and our justification, he gets excited about reconciliation to one another. I mean, you read the book of Acts, like that's, that's what it's all about, is he wants people to be reconciled back to God and then be reconciled to one another. And he says here in chapter 3, verse 7, I've, I've given my life, I was called as an apostle to make known the gospel to the Gentiles, as a Jew, to the Gentiles to show them what the power of God can do. This is what I was called to. He says, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Again, that language, given, it's a gift. He says, this is a gift, this opportunity for ministry to, to unite people back to God and unite people to one another is a gift from God. It's a grace from God. And if that's not clear enough, look at, look at how he identifies himself at the beginning of verse 8. He says, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints. He says it's, it's all grace. It's all grace. And we see elsewhere, Paul has a better resume than anyone else in the New Testament. He says, I'm, I'm the very least of all the saints, but it was by God's grace that I've been reconciled. It's by God's grace that we've been reconciled to Christ, unto salvation, to one another in Christ, Jew, Gentile, us young, old, it's, it's, we're reconciled to Christ, we're reconciled in Christ, and we're reconciled for Christ. We, like Paul, we have now the gospel, which is, it's a, it's a gift for us, for us to receive individually, for us to enjoy corporately, and for us to share missionally. This is a gift from God. We are called to receive it and partake in it. That's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, you've received the message of reconciliation, and now you are messengers of reconciliation. So go make Christ known. This isn't just something for us to just enjoy and shut our doors and just huddle around and and not do anything with. No, we need to make Christ known to all the world. Friends, this God-given message is a gift. This is where we get the power of God. This is where we get the power of God. And we we need to be captivated by this. We have to be. This is why Paul says, I've given my life to preach to the Gentiles. I've given my life. And in that happening, this is what, where we see our, our, the second gift. In, in the Jew and Gentile now becoming one in Christ, we see the second gift of God for our strength is that we have a God-given purpose. We have a God-given purpose. Look at verse 10. We have a God-given purpose. Where does this play out? Where does this reconciliation play out? Where does, where does this message take place today? Where does the power of God shine today. If you read the end of verse 8 and 9, he says, to me, I, although I'm the least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, to bring to light every, for everyone what was the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that, there's your causation phrase, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God would be made known. So who's the ultimate agent of reconciliation? Who is? Come on, talk to me. Who's the ultimate agent of reconciliation? God. Jesus. God. Yes. Okay, good. Good. We're all here. All right. God is, right? And where does he display this? In his church. In his church. And how does he do this? He does this by uniting two hostile and different people groups together in Christ. That's why it says the manifold wisdom of God. Manifold, that, that, that means it's many-sided, it's multicolored, it's diverse. So God's design then in salvation of making his wisdom and glory known here on earth in the church is by uniting people that are very diverse yet united in him. That's God's plan. That's his plan of salvation. And when we realize that, churches will have more diversity than the UN, except we won't be united around world peace, we'll be united around something way greater, eternal peace in Christ. I mean, think about this. Like, when when we begin to understand God's goal and God's purpose, 
of uniting a very different group of people for his glory, then the, the, the racial gaps begin to be bridged in the church, the cultural gaps begin to be bridged in the church, the economic, generational, political, whatever gaps we see in our world that everyone wants to divide over, all of those walls are torn down and bridges are built because we see the power of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ can unite those two very different people. That's what the gospel can do. But when we don't see this, when we just say, well, just the gospel's for me, period, the end, well, then what do we do? We start to look for people or churches that are just like us. We go to churches we like best that either meet our preferences, meet our needs, or, you know, sing the songs we like, or do the things that, and then we just end up with a bunch of people like us. Now, I'm, again, I am not saying, please hear me clearly, I am not saying to sacrifice the truth of the gospel on the altar of diversity. That's not what at all what I'm saying. But we have to remember that God's goal is a diverse salvation. So we have to prioritize that over whatever preferences we have. So we, church, we should seek and, and be after and pray for God's manifold wisdom to be made known in our lives and in our church more than any other preference we might have. We have to be after that because God uses his people and all of our differences to make known his glorious power. That's, that's, that's why I had, you know, Dick and, and Vicky and Buck share this morning before the sermon because I want you guys to know that like, the fact that we're here today is proof of this passage. Like verse 10 is being played out right now in this room. Verse 10 is being played out right now in this room. Most churches, when, when they're facing the decision to close down and they're declining, well, they say, well, we're going to fight by trying, right? We're going to fight or die trying. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to go down with the ship. But the Stonegate elders were, were driven by something greater than their name, something greater than their legacy, something, they, 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 they wanted the gospel to go forth regardless of what name was on the sign out there on Panther Way. That, that did not matter to them at all. They, I mean, they realized, like, yep, yeah, our time as individuals might be up here, but God's not done yet in this building. God is not done yet in this building. We want the gospel to be preached here no matter what. And you can ask any of them. They're, all, they're here today. It wasn't the easiest road. It wasn't super easy. But let me just say, as, as somebody who kind of was an outsider to the whole Stone Gate, everything, it is rare to find humility like what they had here. Like what, what the elders had, what, what Dick and what Frank and Wayne and, and the other elders had, it is rare to find that. I would also argue it's biblical, but it's rare. It's rare. It, it only comes when, when the focus of their whole life and their whole ministry is on God's kingdom and not their own. That that's the only way that they can have that type of humility. That's the only way that they can have that much of, of a concern for the gospel to go forth that says, hey, it's not, it's not about us. We want the gospel preached here. I hope when I'm dead and gone, the gospel is still being preached right here until Christ comes back. That we need to have that heaven mindset. And the result of what happened then is then two churches, we weren't necessarily hostile, we didn't know who each other were, we were very different in a lot of ways, but we were united in the gospel, so two churches focused on God's kingdom came together into one as a strong gospel witness showing God's manifold wisdom, not only to ourselves here, but also to those around us, but also, what we see here in verse 10, to the demonic forces. I mean, realize what it says here. It says, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Now, that could mean angels, sure, but the way that Paul talks about that in chapter 6, verse 12, he very clearly also has Satan and his demonic forces in mind. And so, so what that means then is that God uses his church and unites people that otherwise should never be united to show that his church isn't going anywhere. Like, he said it back to, to Peter and all the disciples in Matthew chapter 16. He said, yeah, Peter, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell is not going to prevail against it. And when Jesus said that, he meant it. 
He meant that he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And our church stands as a reminder of that. Not by anything we've done, but solely by what God has done alone. And and our church stands as a reminder of Satan's destruction and God's certain victory. It does. I mean, it, it does not matter what the devil tries to do. Like, shut down a church, another one will open. Shut down that church, more will be planted. God's not going, I mean, we, you can look back over thousands of years. God's kingdom continues to expand, and Jesus continues to make himself known in all the earth through people, most of which we don't even know who they are. It's faithful gospel witnesses through people like us that Jesus decides to work through and put his power and wisdom through so that not only Satan would know, hey, dude, you lost but also so that we would be a witness to the communities around us. I mean, Satan can try all he wants. It won't work. I mean, he, like, he had the best opportunity to win. God in the flesh on earth, fully human, susceptible to all the things that humans are susceptible to. And I bet the day after Good Friday, Satan was like, we did it, right? I mean, he, he killed God in the flesh. I, I don't think there's a... There's probably a, a more strategic or, I don't know, any, anything else he could have done to try to stop what God's doing other than killing God in the flesh. And how did that work out for him, right? Because through that very act, through Satan's own weapon of death, God used against Satan to do what? To bring redemption to the entire world. So, well, that doesn't work. Okay. Now, again, I'm not saying our church is like the death and resurrection of Christ, right? But I am saying that that the all-powerful God who resurrected Jesus from the grave is the same all-powerful God who is working in and through this church today. It's the same God. And he uses us to reflect and to proclaim his message and his victory. It, It does not matter what will happen. God's way will prevail. And this is what leads us to our third and final strength that we have in the Lord today. We have a God given message. We have a God-given purpose, and that leads to a God-given confidence. This is the third gift that God gives us to strengthen his church. We have confidence. Now, if we haven't already picked up on confidence, right? If verse 8, the gospel can save the very least, that should give us some confidence, okay? If, If that doesn't do it, then verse 10, the manifold wisdom of God is being made known through his church. Okay, but still, I, I, I don't know. Look at verse 11. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. Has realized. That that means it's a done deal. It's completed. It's, It's already accomplished. Like, yes, we saw in verse 10 that God's faithfulness was shown through his church, but here in verse 11, we see that God's faithfulness is shown to his church. How? Through the person and work of Jesus. It it has been done. It is finished. It's not something that then it's just like, well, good luck. I did my part, now you do the rest. No, God has accomplished this. He has done it. He's still doing it, and he's going to keep doing it. Look at the past, present, and future realities of this confidence that we see in verse 11, 12, and 13. Verse 11, past, God has realized. He has fulfilled his eternal purposes in Christ Jesus. Okay, well, what does that lead to? That leads to verse 12. Now, we who are in Christ, we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. We have boldness now. We have access. Like the the throne of grace, which when, when holy men in the Bible got visions of the throne of grace, fell on their face and said, I'm unworthy. The book of Hebrews says that we, being now covered in the blood of Jesus, we can draw near to the throne of grace in our time of need. We have that confidence. We have that access. We have that boldness. So we have it in the past, verse 11. We have it presently, verse 12, and we'll have it in the future, verse 13. Look at verse 13. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. Yeah, we might suffer now. We might have our ups and downs. Our church might might have those family fights. We might have setbacks, whether it's financially or relationally or emotionally or whatever it is. 
We might have those things. I'm not denying that. But, but the sufferings now can't even compare to the glory that's coming. We, we, are, we know the glory that's coming, and, and this is what it is. It's being with Jesus forever. There's a lot on top of that, but, but the essence and the pure, like, what is the gift of glory? What is our confidence that we will be with Christ forever in glory? There is nothing better than that. In, like, that is our confidence in what he's done, in what he's doing, and what he will continue to do for us. That's our confidence. And we can be certain of, of these truths because God doesn't change. He hasn't. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he is faithful to keep his word. And so this is what I want to leave you with today. Before we sing and, and take the Lord's Supper and, and pray, it, it does not matter what happens in a church. It doesn't matter what the devil tries to do. God will accomplish his purposes. He will. We have to be confident in that. He is our strength. So you say, where does the church's strength come from? It comes from God. And God has given us and this to strengthen us and sustain us when times are hard. He's given us the gospel. He's given us his message. He's given us a purpose. And he's given us confidence. So what I want to do in place of, I, I normally just, I pray kind of spontaneously for you guys after every sermon. What I want to do is I want to actually pray verses 14 to 21 over you before we take the Lord's Supper. So would you please join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, for this reason, we bow our knees before you, Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of your glory, you might grant us to be strengthened with the power through your Spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church, in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.